to come in from Cloud9 yeah. to see what they want to opt for this time around. Well, I agree with Jensen that the C9 draft was greedy with the Ribbon, Top, LeBlanc, Mid, and Kennen bottom lane. <laughs> but UOL's draft was equally as greedy because they picked all late game and could have been overly smashed in the laning phase. But they held tough in that matchup as they have done in both of their victories yesterday. So really interested to see if the similar trends go this game. I think C9 is going to pick better late game. I still expect UOL to pick late game. I feel like both these teams have very similar styles and in their ability to, to very much hold their own during the laning phase. You see a few skirmishes back and forth, but I feel like neither of these teams really get an early lead and then snowball from that early lead. They're very much about getting a, going even or slightly ahead and then transitioning into the mid to late game where they really have that big power. And that's why I'm expecting big playmaking champions like this Gragas. Yeah, and there were pretty heavy bans on the Jungras here. They actually took Elise and Kha'Zix away from contracts. His Lee Sin is actually still really good. He may not want to do that into Gragas. Rek'Sai is still available, and so is his famed Nunu, which he brought out last week in the North American LCS. So I don't think they're getting that much mileage out of their bands from the OL side, aside from the Oriana. Interesting, too, as they have now instead, they took Tristana off the board last time, not going to go for it this time. Thought the Cosmics was a bigger priority, and you can understand that after watching mm -hmm. the Cosmics game, but maybe not giving enough respect over to the depths of Contracts' champion pool. He's going to be the first pick LeBlanc for Jensen. I don't think that is a surprise to any Cloud9 fan. He is an absolute terror on that pick. Yeah, the only thing that could be a little bit surprising is if they said, you know, they were going to have a, a, you know, a better scaling draft. Not necessarily the case. They still need to snowball around the mid lane right now. It's something they're very good at, uh, but it definitely means Unicorns can get a scaling advantage with whatever they pick in the mid lane. Now, I feel like the Unicorns, they should look to get themselves an early Tom Kench right now. Uh, with the Braum early logged in, you want to try and guarantee that you have that strong bottom lane matchup at the very least. Fascinating that they would go for a very early Gnar. We have seen them uh, pick up a Gnar in their last series versus the Cloud9, but they what? did that in the second half what? of the draft. And the fact that they've locked in their top <laughs> and mid lane Guys, too. Are, are you okay. seeing something familiar? Yeah, what? okay, so Dracos? if we look at the bottom, we see that this is very similar. We're missing a Twitch uh, and a Thresh. But we remember that they got just destroyed in the early game, right? And uh -huh. then Cloud9 got a little over aggressive, gave them a window to come back. I, I don't feel like this draft won Unicorns to love the game. Why well, fix what isn't broken, eh, Dracos? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it was broken. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Well, Unicorns of Love tried and true. They like Exile on the Cassidy, and they like Vizichachi on the Gnar, and apparently not too concerned about what they'll be playing up against. Both teams have opted for very different strategies here in the mm -hmm. first round of picks, so we can expect very different yeah. bands in phase two. So even if Unicorns of Love's early mid lane laning phase isn't that great, I don't actually think Gnar is that bad of an early laner. It is open to some sort of counter picks, like if Ray wanted to play Aurelia. Riven, maybe? Uh, or or, or like a Riven. A Riven would really smash it, uh, as we saw yesterday. But uh, we're actually not seeing that many differences here, aside from C9 having the Ash instead of the Kennen so they can actually force around a winning lane if they get that lane winning. I still like what Unicorns is doing because I think it fits them. Yes, this is very classic Unicorns of Love. And uh, I, I had a great chat with the Unicorn of Love uh, team earlier on. I was very much like, guys, like... Oh, oh, and Vedius also then told us he had a great chat with I Unicorns. Did, <laughs> said, but I'm not going to tell you about that. I want to tell this story gonna on It's going to blow air. your minds. So. <laughs> not to set any expectations. Guys! Go, go, go. Tell, your, tell your story, Vedius. <laughs> so I had a chat because I was very curious about why they put so much emphasis on Blitzcrank and why they're just so willing to pick some of these unique and interesting champions. And when you talk to the players, it's just like, nah. It feels good, right? Like That is the <laughs> emphasis. That is the core play style of the Unicorns of Love. Their players just go, you know what? It just feels right. And that's why they so often pick some of these weird champions into like, matchups that you just don't expect. How long was that conversation? You Wait, were it was like yeah. 20 minutes. And it was about Blitzcrank, <laughs> okay. but I just thought I'd give a TLDR because the fans have already come through and it's Draco's job to run us through them. Wow. Well, TLDR. It feels right, folks. Yeah. Zaya Thresh banned off. Rek'Sai Lee Sin on the opposite side. Cloud9 going to go with the Rengar coming in yeah. here for contracts. They kind of have to. I mean, look at the jungle bands that got thrown through. That's four jungle bands that Unicorns threw at them. The Zac is also gone, so this is technically the sixth available jungler. And Contracts' as Rengar has been really good in the past. I do remember him. I believe he brought this out in the TSM series that C9 did win as well. And I know that he has had a fair amount of success with it within his own region. Uh, so I feel like that he can still play, but it's something that the European team's definitely not as familiar with, uh, given the uh, last few weeks, even months. Taking their time here on this final rotation, as Hill is saying, 
flashes through his SO's initials. Classic, it was saying. But I don't think it's going to be the Blitzcrank this time around, Vettius. I nope. don't think he's going to pick what feels good for him. And I think he's going to pick what feels good for the team. I'm very happy that he picked Tom Kench. I think it makes the most sense. I think that it's a great pick into the Braum and answer to the Ash Arrow as well. And I am surprised that C9 would rather ban away the Thrash than the uh, the Tom, but I think that it's just because they're afraid of the playmaking power the Hill Sang does have. And we're very likely going to see a, uh, a North American classic uh, as they round out that round. Yeah, at this point, Ray hasn't had the greatest of tournaments, but definitely has had some good games on Kled in the past. And this is a team from C9 now that can collapse on a focal point of strength if they get one of them through the laning phase, which against UOL is fairly likely. But then on UOL side, I feel like their team composition is really strong in team fights if C9 doesn't run away with you. <laughs> we saw yesterday against TSM, if you get into those fights against Unicorns of Love, they are not a team that hesitates to execute so the question for me is, is C9 going to put that same priority into the mid lane that we have seen so frequently and can Exile, a man who has been the subject to so much criticism, a weak point for the Unicorns of Love, you know, stop the bleeding early and just stay calm until they can scale up? And the thing is, here in Europe, there are two ways in which you beat the Unicorns of Love. Number one, you snowball an early game lead and you're just so relentless with your pressure that the Unicorns, they just can't do anything about it. Or you're number two, you pick a composition that outscales them and you just beat them in team fights later on because you know that's what they're trying to do. And right now, what C9 is trying to do is go for the early game lead and play for the one through one and just split the Unicorns up and never give them a proper opportunity to fight. But when they have the Nut and the Cassidy, if they get to late game, they have the options to one through one but because it's the Unicorns, you know they're going to go for those 5v fights and force them as often as they can. Yeah, and I'm asking the question, at what minute mark will Exile be dove in the mid lane turret by three <laughs> people from C9? Because that seems to happen every time Jensen plays the block. Let us know on Twitter, at LO Esports, hashtag NAWin or hashtag EU win. When do you think Exile will be dived yeah. under his tower? Hashtag four minutes, hashtag <laughs> two and a half. <laughs> We will find out. It is Unicorns of Love up against Cloud9, a repeat matchup from what we saw last time. Unicorns guy is here. North American fans, you may not know him, but we know him well here <laughs> in the EU LCS, and that is the Love Hurts crew backing up their boys. Unicorns took down this matchup last time. Can they do it again is the big question. That really comes through well. He's a very loud person. He is. He is very loud. Uh, he's a very dedicated fan. And uh, focusing in on the, the two composition, we talked very much about their ability to scale, Unicorns of Love, their early power, not the strongest. But when you look across the board, like in the bottom lane, yes, C9 definitely have the advantage. You have an Ash and a Braum, a lot of pushing power. It's very difficult for a Twitch to trade into the Ash as well. And even if he does, you have this massive uh, Braum shield that can mitigate a lot of the damage. So pushing value in favor of the bottom lane in the mid. Jensen on the LeBlanc he should have early push advantage. And the reason why I'm not a massive fan of Cassidy into LeBlanc is because these days, LeBlanc actually built a lot of AD. She's gonna rush the Gunblade. If she wants to, she has the ability to go for very early Cutlass, and you can just harass the Cassidy out of lane with simple basic attacks. And his laning phase becomes extremely difficult, even at the 15 to 20 minute mark, once he's completed a Rod of Ages, simply because of the amount of sustain that LeBlanc gets from the Gunblade as well. And I know it's really common to start Dark Seal refillable into a Corrupting Potion on Cassidy, uh, but not starting with the Doran Shield means he might be forced into a really early recall or teleport back to lane. Bit of aggression comes in here, though, around the early Raptor start. And speaking of the junglers, Rengar, not a pick we have seen so much in the EU LCS. Xerxes, one of the few people to pull it out but really wanting to see what impact this pick is going to have on the early game. We've seen Rengars where they get a kill early, they take over a game, and we've seen the Rengars who farm up for six and wait for that ultimate before they can find impact. Yeah, I've definitely heard of NA Rengar before. Uh, <laughs> the term gets thrown around a lot. However, Contracts did have a 15 kill Rengar game in the spring split. Uh, in one of them, as Vedius mentioned, he's also pulled it out this split, so definitely one of the better Rengars. That being said, it has been nerfed a multitude of times since it was really OP earlier on in the year. Those were good times. Were they? I, I played Rengar during those times. They were great times. <laughs> As a mid laner, it did not feel good. Um, looking at options that he does have to gank, 
Top lane could be an opportunity because there's a lot of all-in power, but you always have to be wary of the Meganar transformation and the turnaround potential of the Nar. In the mid lane, it's always a good option, but once Kasten hits level six, he's going to have a lot more mobility. So as long as Jensen can land the chains, then you're looking at a really good spot. Ooh. But I feel the best lane for him to gank would be down in the bottom lane. The Ash Arrow, the chains he see from the Brawl, and then the follow-up from the Rengar engage, I feel like that's where he's more likely going to find the most reliable ganks and the best place to try and snowball. And that bottom lane already suffering very very far behind in CS as Vizichachi and Ray continue to trade. Quick Goomba stomp, looking for the proc on that Hyper, and Ray definitely not getting the better of that trade, but as long as he can remount, he should be okay here in the early laning phase as C9 Go for the early jungle invade. Yeah, I do think the Cloud has to play very aggressive in laning phase, so I'm curious to see where Zerse goes for his gank. But I do want to point out two missed CS Jensen had right before his recall. He missed a cannon minion and a range minion, and then recalled for Dark Seal. But if he would have had those two CS, he would have had enough gold for Control Ward, which allows him to have a lot more pressure in the mid lane. So those little things can have some pretty far-reaching consequences. And I'm surprised Jensen missed both of those CS. Oh, Ray getting baited in. Yordle fight, but there's a fat man from behind, and that is not what you want to see if you're Ray. In he now. goes. Ray, oh, first blood going to drop for the Unicorn's love. I feel like we've seen this before. The Cled goes in. They want to try and get a lot of early trading. They want to take advantage of their passive where they can just get Skull back, and then they'll have the health advantage. But by playing that aggressively, by being so forward in the lane, it allows Zersik to punish him, and they get first blood over in the top side of the map. And Ray, five isolated deaths already this tournament. He does have two solo kills, but continuously maybe looking for those outplay opportunities. Is not going to find it on the top side of the map, and that's going to put him at a pretty decent deficit here early on. However, have a center sights on the mid lane once again. We're really waiting for Jensen to have that big impact. LeBlanc was and has been his signature pick over the course of the tournament, it feels like. And Exile surviving surprisingly well here in the early game. Yeah, burned his teleport to get back to wave. Jensen walked back to lane. So Exile actually with an item advantage, a second Dark Seal against Jensen, really just trying to survive this laning phase as much as possible. The one thing that does stack with the Dark Seals is the base AP as well as the percentage it increases your health potions by. So his Corruption Potion will give him a huge amount of sustain. And I think he's actually going to be getting out of this laning phase, at least to level six, from a pretty okay state. And it's surprising given how dominant Jensen has been throughout this tournament, because as an individual, he has been one of the best performing. Just look at his KDA, the fact that he has such a significant CSD. And the thing is, these stats are ranked out of every single player in the tournament. Statistically, he is one of the best performing individuals that we have here at Rift Rivals of 2017. And the big one that always draws my attention to those three deaths. All of those have happened after 24 minutes. This man has never died in the laning phase. He has never given up anything, it feels like, early on in the game. Always an enjoyable player to watch, and a lot of hype was surrounding both Bjergs and his Jensen as they came over to the European side, got to play against their European brethren, and so far, they've certainly had a number <laughs> on a lot of uh, European mids. It's been a bit grim for the European squads in the mid lane, but Jensen yeah. maybe now looking to get more aggressive. Contracts invading the jungle as well, and C9 starting to put down a decent amount of pressure here onto the Unicorns. Yeah, I do think one thing for C9 uh, that hurts them being able to play like super aggressive in the early game is the fact that they were pushed into that Rengar in the jungle. Contracts isn't going to have his most effective gank until he hits level 6. Being able to get some counter jungling off and some deep wards is good for C9, but I mean, look what's happening in the top lane. It's a travesty at the moment. They're down 20 CS. Uh, basically, Fizzichachi is Jensening Ray, as what Jensen has done to other mid laners. So is that the term now, Jensening <laughs> someone? Yeah, when you completely destroy their soul in laning phase. Oh, God. But, but for, for UOL, since they have such a good late game team composition, this is a, a fantastic first seven minutes. And it's, it's great that you're mentioning that because Chachi has been one of the best performing top laners that we've had at this tournament. This guy, he has the highest CSD at 10, the highest gold difference of 15, and he has one of the lowest jungle proximities for any top laner in the tournament. These guys do not actually invest a huge number of resources into Chachi, yet he still performs even when the whole team is not having the best of games. So I've always been impressed with this guy as an individual. Yeah, spring split MVP. Although one of those stats is not like the yeah. other. <laughs> one of those stats is bad. Uh, five Teams ideas, like to camp him, okay? They, it does happen. <laughs> but um, he was a really big facilitator in why they were able to win their game yesterday against TSM. The big NAR ultimate followed by all the Vladimir damage around the Baron pit really swung the game in favor of Unicorns of Love, and that's why they're now sitting at this 2 and tool record and uh, looking like one of the favorites to make it to the final. But we're still in the early game. Right now, Exalt, he's getting a little bit more control over 
over this lane. The fact that Jensen's prioritizing early AP rather than going AD means that now that Exile's completed the catalyst and maxed his Q, he's going to have much healthier trading patterns against the LeBlanc. Still surprised he's going for the Thunderlords, though. I, I feel like Deathfire right now is just so much better for him as a mid lane champion. He likes to kill people, Thaddeus. He likes to kill people early and often. And it hasn't happened yet this tournament, but it could. Now Ray getting aggressive. Rangar on the way in. That is the crucial level six point that you mentioned earlier. But Vizichachi just going to flash out. So a flash for flash trade in the end. Yeah, and the ultimate of Rengar, I think, is really big. Ray did so much to try and bear trap him on a rope away from flashing, but Vizichachi timed it just right, getting the bounce on the hop right before his flash to break the tether. Hard to do, because if that tether lands, Contracts jumps in and they get the kill. Very close, but surviving the skin of his teeth in the end has to burn the flash. Maybe Contracts can look for a repeat gank, but as you mentioned, really needs that ultimate to be a reliable threat to be able to come in quickly and exile. Just kind of messing with him at this point in the game. LeBlanc coming as well, but Exile just going to back off, not looking for any aggressive play. In his winning lane against Jensen, his teleport's pretty much completely back off of cooldown. He arguably had an item advantage with the Catalyst, and he's still getting a lot of harass off onto Jensen, so doing really well today, especially when you consider the way his tournament began. Yeah, and I think we have to say, I mean, he's been the subject of so much criticism both locally in Europe as well as in this tournament. But this is probably the best laning phase he has had so far, and it looks good for him right now. But this is also one of his best champions, too. Like, during the regular season of the LCS, when he was on Castle, when he was on champions that he couldn't afford to be aggressive on, was when he was performing the best. And it was really nice to see how often that teams would actually show respect and ban it away because that was when Exile wasn't giving away all these free kills in lane, when he wasn't giving away all these free deaths to allow the enemy team to, to get these early advantages against you a while. Now though, landing phase just continues to move forward. Neither team making any massive map plays, but Exile Continuing to get aggressive, trying to proc the Thunderlords here, and Jensen and Exile are just at each other's throats in the laning phase, but Jensen maybe just waiting to back off his contracts, ready to move into the mid lane, but has been spotted out by the ward. Is Exile going to back off or just continue to play aggressive here? Yeah, they might be trying to counter gank, which is pretty dangerous against a Rengar when you have a low health cast in like that. It's going to be interesting to see in the if lane. they try and force it versus just back away. Cersei unfortunately sweeps, but the ward is just outside of his range. And you can see Sneaky and Smoothie have moved up through the river as well. This will allow Samix and Hillerstein to get the push on bot. Force that wave underneath the tower. And this bottom lane has had a fairly healthy laning phase. They haven't suffered as much as uh, you would expect, yeah. given how much priority Sneaky's had over the lane. I mean, I, I listen to you guys complain about UOL a lot, because you say, <laughs> hey, they are so good at team fighting if only they would just play a conservative laning phase so they weren't constantly playing from behind, man, they would be such a good team. It's, it's happening, yes. this game, for the first time in the history of the world, apparently, <laughs> where they're, <laughs> they're winning all of their laning phases oh, with the scaling comp. The key thing is Exile, because so many of the early deficits come from a kill being going down onto him. We may not have time, as another gank happens. Return gank. Moving forward, Contract trying to leap in, looking for the four stack. The Ferocity is just going to lock him down, and that's the death for Visit Chachi and the kill for C9. And another good timing from C9, because they take advantage as Jensen now, he's very low. Running for his life, does have the distortion out. Exile can't afford to chase that one, but it is action across the map here. It may have taken 10 minutes for it to get started, but now both teams are starting to look for these fights. But backtracking to that play in the top lane, note how well C9 are playing around the fact that every time Visage actually goes into mini Nar form, that's when they try to force a gank. That's when they try and shut him down because that's why he is squishiest and the most likely time to get a kill and the risk of a counter gank is very low. Yeah, and if C9 want to do more of that, they have to get control wards in the river because when they tried to camp Jensen's lane this game they have consistently been walking over wards and that's allowed Exile to play much more conservatively and it's allowed Xersei to be there for the counter gank so so far I think so good for Yoel and C9 actually even though they did get that one gank off this is not the early game I think they would want when they're picking LeBlanc but I still think this is okay for C9 because one thing that I will credit them for is something that they have very similarly to that of Yoel which is that they're really good at finding late game fights. Like the way when I saw them play yesterday, they were pretty much just sitting in a brush, just waiting for the enemy team to just be slightly out of position. Boom, instantly 
getting a really positive fight for them, catching targets out of position, and it was simply a matter of just having really good vision control and knowing exactly when they can make plays happen. And with Sneaky on this Ash, with Jensen on this LeBlanc, I think there's a huge amount of pick potential that they could try and take advantage of as the game progresses. And they're continuing to pressure forward, knocking down a little bit of damage onto that tower, but the CS remains relatively even. Samix actually pulling out to a small lead, and Botlane just has not been the center of action for either of these teams. More focus on the top side from both junglers and kind of just waiting for this one to blow up. Jensen here may be the trigger. But there's a ward. C9 yeah. getting warded so consistently. Not something we normally praise Unicorns of Love for early vision control, but they have been incredibly diligent in Xerxes especially in placing down that early vision. Yeah, it does feel like C9's wards have gotten a little bit better. Uh, we talked about sty stylistic tendencies in the early game, how UOL usually just kind of goes over aggressive and gives up a lot of deaths. This is more of a C9 style of early game, uh, where they actually haven't jumped out to huge leads against teams, sometimes actually just accept small deficits, because as Vedia said, they're very good at forcing fights in the mid and late game. Stylistically, actually, you don't think that matches up super well with UOL, though, because UOL uh, are the king of forcing fights in the mid lane over in Europe. So that's why it's exciting, Jack. I'm really interested <laughs> to see when and how this game explodes open. Waiting for it. Neither team looking to contest the draw, or rather, UOL not looking to contest the mountain drake. Right? Xerxes throws in a cask, and that means C9 gets it in the end. So a small advantage to C9, but no big skirmishes, no big fights. We have a, a single gank on the top side of the map, two rather. And now C9 going to break a tower. It is going to be an increase in tempo, though, as Unicorns of Love are now moving out of the top side. But first tower blood for Cloud9. And this is a very classic move for the Unicorns of Love. Often they do it a little bit earlier because they are normally in slightly larger deficits during the early game. But what they've basically done is they've realized we're eventually going to lose this tower, even though we're doing absolutely fine in farm. We still don't have the push, so our tower is gradually getting killed as a gank happens mid. Exile now running for his life. Contracts now moving forward. Exile so low, going to lock him up. Contracts on the Rengar coming in. Yeah, and Exile just second guessed where he should retreat from because he didn't really know what angle Rengar was approaching. Nice secure there. There's a Chachi going to move forward, but no minion arm means no chase down onto Zig. Meanwhile, the Rift Herald going to be set in the sights of the Unicorns of Love. C9, though, pushing in the mid lane. Maybe they can get something back. Vizichachi continues to just threaten the top lane, and it is all out aggression, but now oh, he's locked up under the tower. Out, gets it. Vizichachi, the hop, the jump away, but oh. now pulled back. Ray just going to finish this one out. Beautiful play there oh. from C9, but Chachi is going to get out. Need. There's the charge, blast cone. He Ray's not going to find it. Chachi, you have it! Oh. It he looked like Ray was almost trying to give the kill to Sneaky or something, <laughs> because it, it, it felt like he stopped auto-attacking, but... Visit Chachi just makes a miracle happen and gets away. Oh man, the man of mystery himself, Mr. Visit Chachi. But let's have a look at how this gang happens earlier on because Jensen uh, had taken a few favorable trades early on during the laning phase. He's yeah. able to successfully land the chain, and now you can see how much harder it is for Exile to escape. Interestingly, he's not really expecting the gang to happen. Because he walks back. Yeah. Wait, no, he must have. That's why he flashed, right? Because he sees yeah. the thing above his head, he flashes away, and then he walks back into lane. He should have walked towards Tom Kent. Yeah, but of he, course. He, he probably didn't know what angle Contracts was coming from, right, whether right, it was right. through the lane or through the river. So definitely an avoidable one. Yeah, now the trades just continue in the middle lane. And you can see. Zuchachi, but Jensen now firing back. As you mentioned, the Gunblade, pretty big part of this build. Ooh. It gives you so much additional sustain as well, and this is why I also am not a massive fan of the Thunderlords into the matchup, because Deathfire just gives you so much more continued harass, and the Thunderlords really wants you to go all in, and it makes it easier for Jensen to land thing like the chain and his full combo, add to the Gunblade and the sustain that he gets, he's always going to come out on top. Ray and Jensen now setting their sights on that middle lane. I, the Herald, still available for Xerxes and the Unicorns of Love, but now the tower score is evened up, and the gold just about dead even across the board. Surprising to see Unicorns 11 team who struggled in the early game go so even and C9 and UOL just feel like they're poised for an insane mid game. But now the map has opened up with the mid tier one down, the bottom tier one down. The only thing that C9 are really looking to play around is that tier one in the top lane, but it also gives a freedom for Jensen to move around the map. Yes, he'll stay mid to try and keep this tower healthy, but the reality is he has a teleport available. It's very easy for him to come back should he need to, but also this is a great opportunity for C9 to try and make plays happen. They have the Ash Arrow, the Rengar ulti, and the damage on LeBlanc. It means that you will have to be very careful with their vision, which if you just look at the minimap right now, is heavily in the favor of C9. Yeah, and I think UOL would be okay as long as they can fight around NAR. It's a 54 CS advantage at this stage in the game. I still don't feel like any teams have an answer to visit Chachi's NAR. He's now played it three games in a row. The Kled certainly does not seem like one. Here's the Herald, though. They want to push. 
Moving forward. Minwave not there to back him up. They're just going to rely on the immediate damage and the Rift Herald to tank this one out. Chachi is Mega, so it's not a great time for C9 to force. Be careful. Counting down, maybe waiting out the duration on the throw hunt. Don't think he has Look enough time. Look at Cled. Arrow goes in under his charge. He's about to turn many perfect timing from Cloud9, but that is the interrupt. In comes the charge onto the backside. Exile in trouble. They're looking to take him down. Exile gonna drop. Now Ray is on the front lines running face first into Samix. He's gonna get dismounted. Smoothie gonna try to back it off, and Unicorns are gonna pull away, but that is the kill in the favor of Cloud9. Suddenly, though, Cersei moving forward. Jensen Whoa. backing off. Hillisang going in alone. And he's gonna pay with his life for that one. That's going to be the 2-0. And this is exactly what we were talking about earlier on. Cloud9 are so good at finding these fights. At first, they pop the Rengar ultimate early, and you think, why are they trying to engage right now when the Mega Knight is available? But they pick the timing just right. As the Mega Nar is running out, they use the arrow onto him so that he can't even get his ulti out. And then just keep your eyes on Ray down in the river. He's waiting for the flank. And I heard the players just shouting, focus casting him, focus casting him. And that is immediately who the entire team collapsed upon as they shut down Exile. Yeah, they get him with the Braum and then they want to continue chasing. But Samux, to his credit, gets a lot of damage through onto the rest of C9 to make them back away. And then a bit of overconfidence by UOL for sure. Beautiful flash by Sneaky there. Otherwise, he would have been hit by Xerxes taunt flash or body slam flash and then a questionable abyssal void by Hillsong. And another, another thing that uh, Chachi was telling me earlier in the day was, you know, sometimes you just got to flash in. And I feel like this is not one of those times that it's saying like, there could have been a great opportunity for you to just chill out, relax. You went okay in the fight. You only lost one member. You should have just disengaged. And in his defense, he started channeling the abyssal voyage as Xerxes was going in. I think he was convinced the body slam was going to land, that they were going to turn the fight in their favor. But the second that flash from Sneaky that you noted comes out, things fall apart and the fight turns against them. And that means another dragon dropping in the favor of Cloud9. Yeah, and I want to see if they keep having these big fights in the mid lane, because I think eventually, that would favor UOL. Uh, we mentioned how C9 is, you know, really good at finding fights. Against UOL, you, you know where to look. You look in the <laughs> mid lane because they're so often trying to just mob up around that turret. C9 still holding that turret with a little bit of health and Exile actually trying to get on Sneaky, but... May have uh, overestimated yeah. exactly how much damage Ambitious. he does. He's only got the Rod of Ages, so his uh, threat is not as high as Sneaky's is at this point in the game. Uh, won't lose anything as a result of it. We'll just catch the wave, but I'm just so impressed with the vision from C9. Like, every single objective that they've been setting up for so far, there's always been very clear warning around what they want to do. And they just took the dragon down in the bottom lane, and you can just see how the setup had come before, so they knew that it was a very clean take. They have three control wards in the top side of the map, so while the invest uh, vision investment isn't massive, it's still around like, hey, we still have some a good idea if you well are trying to go for a sneaky Baron rush, and it's it's very much C9 being very smart about where they set up vision to try and punish you all. And Vettius, I feel like if teams are showing us where they want to set up plays with vision, Unicorns of Love are, are showing us the classic. So much of that vision in mid lane. Two in the mid lane <laughs> alone. And those guys, mm -hmm. I feel like they just want to fight. We see this so frequently across these games in Rift Rivals that Unicorns Love just are not worried about anywhere else. They want to fight in that mid lane. And their actual engage, I'd say, isn't as reliable as what C9 has with the Ash Arrow and the Kled Ultimate. They kind of need Xerxes to go and make a big play with his flash down. So uh, in the meanwhile, like this, if they have more people there, they're going to be able to push. But this isn't necessarily a team fight. Not going to be the case, but we can see Unicorns Love coming even just about on the goal of the 20 minutes. Normally down 2K, only down 1K this time around. So it looks a little bit better for them. Of course, a much better early game. The mid-game fight goes in the favor of C9, though, to give them a small advantage. And sadly, this is not the same case as we always see, where they're guaranteed the win with some late-game scaling Vladimir, but it does look very good with the Unicorns alone. And there's one thing that I can promise both of you, and that this <laughs> will be a quick game because the Unicorns of Love, their average game time at this tournament is 29 minutes and 41 seconds, which is mm -hmm. pretty damn fast. It is the fastest average game time out of all of the teams in Rift Rivals, and that is because whether they are winning or losing, Unicorns of Love always say, I have a battering ram and I'm ready to run it down mid. What is a Vettius guarantee worth? Well, <laughs> if, if it goes longer, if it's a 40 minute game, because I've yeah, seen it, a few uh, in the last few days. It's an average game Vettie. time, right? Like, just bear that in mind. All I'm yeah, saying you is that it would be I, 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 one thing I can guarantee you both one. is that it's going to be a fast game. Hmm. Okay. I will guarantee you both dinner. There you go. If it's not a fast game, come on, Unicorns, you owe me. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I, I think it, it definitely could be with the way this game could explosively move in one way or the other, but C9 isn't necessarily the fastest scale team, and the game is still really close. Plus, we've seen C9 have those really ugly games earlier against <laughs> yeah. T2 where it went on and on and on. So, can't wait to see how this actually if does. If you just cast or curse us into a 70 minute game, <laughs> I swear to <laughs> God. You mean it'll be super hype and I'll be, be really excited about it. 70 minute game of high quality League of Legends, because that's all you get in those kind of games. But now things have definitely slowed down a little bit. Baron is still a big point of contention for both these teams, and I feel like everyone is just waiting for the two items. The second item spike, where teams can really turn on and feel very confident, especially for Exile, who's working towards that Lich Bane. Definitely not really built for team fighting, but it will give you a lot of additional damage when trying to get onto that back line. Yeah, and I see this from C9's perspective, like, Jensen wants to get the 1v1s or the 2v1s in the side lane, but Unicorns is just never there. They're yes. split pushing different lanes and they're constantly re-pulling him towards mid. So the more they can pull Jensen into the, their main squad, the better it is for UL, because that's not where LeBlanc shines. Interesting too, because normally it's the Cassidy that we see on the sidelines, but Exile so consistently grouping up with the team. This is the sort of same strategy we saw when Vizichachi picked the Aurelia. Willing to group those split pushers, move them into the mid lane and just look to kind of disable the advantages, in this case, that Jensen can provide Unicorns of Love. Just continuing their pressure down mid lane, their play around mid lane, clearing out their side waves and immediately moving right back mid. But Cloud9 just doing the same. And really no one contesting the Baron yet means it is just going to slow down the game. I like Righteous Glory on Zersei as well. Got to mention just one of the few that isn't going Runic Echoes on Gragas, I think the Cinder Hulk is better for pure tankiness in the late game, and you're still doing a lot of damage with that now cheaper and better to clear the jungle item that is the Cinder Hulk. So also think they have a lot of damage in the late game with the Kassin and the Twitch, so they're scaling in the right ways. I would like to see them actually do something like a double Knight's Vow between the Gragas and the Tom Kench as their third and fourth items, probably after Cersei builds up a locket on Gragas. So, I do feel like they're team fighting for a lot of reasons, champions as well as items, will scale better if they can continue to keep this game stalled. C9's not making any headway with these split pushing games. Jensen's never getting to fight people. But there are pings in the middle lane. You can see Rengar hanging off or towards the side. Jensen, he has just had to clear out this top wave. And remember this double TP. Right now there's no deep vision investment from the side of C9, so it's gonna be difficult for them to get the same kind of flank that they had before. But just look at the lack of vision coming out from the Unicorns of Love. It should mean that if Ray wants to walk over, you'll well will not be able to easily spot him out. When we look at the awkward position that Cloud9 are in as we get later into the game, the Gragas with the cast, he may not have the damage, but he has the disengage for these picks. Like the Rengar, like the Kled on the top side of the map, the Braum is, or not the Braum, rather the Tom Kench as well, who can interrupt a lot of the assassination potential that Rengar and LeBlanc bring. And C9 can't find some skirmishes or some greater advantages. It does feel like Unicorns of Love are just going to be the there team that wins Jensen. out on the stall. But not going to stall for much longer. The double bounce coming in for Vizichachi. Range extended on this patch. May not be the These biggest the factor. These fight C9 wants when they're not fighting the majority of UOL. Wallop comes down, Kled charging in, mm, is going to find no Cersei, way not the target that he wanted. Vizichachi tries to throw him back, Boulder goes out as he switches to mini, and both teams just going to back away. Yeah, I think Ray actually had instant regret after casting that ultimate because the arrest of C9 wasn't going to engage, but it does buy them time to get a Mountain Drake. Oh. Are they going to get it though? Yes. <laughs> no steal. Cloud9 secure the second Mountain Drake for themselves. That will make it easier if they want to pressure the Baron. Will make it much easier to contest those major objectives, but still have to find that pick or that fight before they can get there. We did see earlier on in the day the EU teams are the best at contesting around these dragons, but they are still willing to fight you for your towers. So while C9 were backing away from that objective, it gave you a well the path towards that tier one. So now the entire map has opened up. It will give you all the freedom to get the deep div vision down if they want to try and make a play. And looking at some of the ultimates that are unavailable right now, see, uh, Ray doesn't have his ulti, Contrax doesn't have his ulti, and while Chanchi also doesn't have his ulti, the fact that Meganar still has a fair amount of CC, I feel like this would be a good time if you all want to try and force a fight. And the thing about the Gnar, that Meganar ultimate is really short cooldown. Mm -hmm. Due to the constrictions of the, the form swap, you know, you're gifted with that low cooldown, and now Vizichachi can have it again pretty soon. Yeah, what? and I think it's going to move towards a Baron game now. I mean, double Mountain Drake for C9 gives them a lot of threat over the area, but that's also kind of what UOL is waiting for. They're waiting for C9 to break out of this 1-3-1 pattern so they can force 
of 5v5. We talked before about how they need Xerce to get the initiation, so they'd actually need C9 to be grouped up around Baron for something like that to happen. Once again, 27 minutes, 30 seconds into the game with Yoel having only one kill. Rather peculiar, but yeah. I still think it's okay for them in the grand scheme of things. Yeah with their late-game team fighting. Uh, you look at the damage dealt to champions this game, and we have to remember, this isn't really from team fighting. This is, this is just from Gnar poking in lane so consistently with the LeBlanc and the Ash poking out as well, because there just has not been a, a ton of action anywhere. Yeah. Really has been uh, quite a slow game, but also very much what, as Jack was saying earlier, you, you more expect from C9 playing more of the slower early game, not necessarily building a lot of their leads from all this immense early jungle action. It's it's not the most common thing to see uh, Jensen get like four kills against Caps after the jungle and the support gank there like three times in a row. Um, so this is a little bit more standard. And now that like we're approaching the 30 minutes, I really am expecting a big fight. Smoothie getting aggressive. Out comes the ultimate from Rangar. Maybe this is the engage option. Samix spat over the wall. They are going to look for the pick onto Hillisang. He pops the thick skin and flashes right over Vizichachi looking for the disengage. Ray not going to connect with the ult, but Hillisang is going to get popped. And now Cloud9 is moving forward. Contract's going to try to lock him up, but it's oh Samix no! untouched in the back line. The Twitch looking for the turn and burn, and here comes Exile. Smoothie running for his life. The rift walk from Exile. The slow not going to be enough. Exile on the front lines. Vizichachi throwing the boulder. Cloud9 getting destroyed. And Cloud9, the over commit to a fight and unicorns of love are able to find the turnaround in that narrow choke point massive team fight swing four dead for c9 baron going to unicorns of love and it's deja vu all over again for c9 in the first game against UOL. They said they had control, they lost one team fight, UOL got Baron, and it was over. So two of the three things have happened here. The mid-game team fight goes UOL, and they get Baron. Now the question will be, can they end after so much of the game being passive? Baron now uncontested and just not enough respect given over. C9 so close, one more pick, walking away. That could have been their Baron, that could have been their fight, but they just stick around too long. Yeah, well they see Kasten in the side lane without teleport, so they know they can go. They can force a fight. They get a lot of damage on the Hillisang. They burn summoner spells across the board, but they commit almost all their damage onto Tom Kench and then trap yeah. themselves in this really small corridor where they've used everything and Twitch can then free hit. And by the way, <laughs> Exile is now here, so it's no longer a 5v5. C9 walk right into a very small space against a Twitch and Cassidy, and they pay the price. Yeah, man, what a great fight from the Unicorns of Love. Really getting a fantastic turnaround, and now they are feeling confident. They are feeling good. Look at how much free damage Saox is able to get on the back line, and it's the, the Hillisang Classic just being like, oh no, I'm out of position. Uh, and often he'll pay his life for it, but sometimes it can also be the ultimate bait in order to get the team fight win for the Unicorns of the Love. Now they've equalized the kills. Now they have the Baron. Let's see if they play the 1-3-1 one, or whether or not they just go back to mid lane and try and force another fight. It's a bad news when your assassin in the mid lane, your pseudo assassin in the jungler on that Rengar, when they can't kill targets in a timely fashion, and Cassidy gets to walk all the way from top over into the middle of the fight. Things looking a bit grim for C9. Now, they're not out of this one yet. A lot of it is going to depend on what Unicorns of Love can do with this Baron and Vettius. Cassidy now committed to the side lane, not quite as predicted. Unicorns of Love running down mid. Yeah, now a level 16 Kassadin as well. Oh, yeah. As an Infinity Edge Twitch with a whole boatload of attack speed. And C9 unable to set up a split push. If they barrel into a 5v5, they most likely lose. So C9, really limited options at this state in the game as to what they can do. And Unicorns of Love are typically a team that are very good at being able to close out games once they have a convincing lead. And here we go, Exile now grouping with the team. Let's see how you're well forced. C9, are they going to fight for this one? Are they just going to back off? For now, they're going to settle for a bit of poke damage. Can't fight the Baron up. Unicorn's a love squad for now. Wards available for TP flanks. Not too many on the side of C9. And don't think this is the fight they'd want to take anyway at this point in the game. And it's a, a sorry state of Mountain Drakes for NA this tournament. I feel like there has now been at least three games where the team gets two to three Mountain Drakes but then they're just not utilizing it properly. In this game in particular, C9 wasn't playing around Baron when they went for that fight down on the bottom side. You can threaten the Baron when you have one or two Mountain Drakes and therefore make picks. What's happening is they're getting these Mountain Drakes, they're not forcing around objectives. Those Drakes are now useless to you until 35 minutes, and then you're losing the fight and EOL is taking Baron. And we have to wonder, how many arrows has Sneaky actually thrown out this game, right? Like, we think about the pick potential with this composition. The 
the Rengar ultimate, the, the Ash arrow, the, the Twitch. There's so many tools to find a pick. Yeah, I feel like C9, they slowed the game down so much without doing anything that they did try to go for a full-on 5v5 mid when I feel like they never really needed to. Like, they could have played towards trying to collapse on someone on a side lane, try and find these small opportunities. And really, they just played into the hands of the Unicorns who eventually found that great 5v5. And now they're on the doors of C9's base. Luckily, C9 is still confident enough to come out and kill those cannon minions, not to let it burn them down, but Vizichachi and Exile on the top side, they're going to take that next tier two, when there's just not a whole lot that C9 can do about it. Rene gets a bit aggressive with that bear trap on the rope. Vizichachi taking some poke damage, and Jensen just using the most of that LeBlanc kit that he can. However, this is just looking so grim for the side of C9. But with Baron buff slowly ticking away, suddenly... A little bit more on even footing. The 5k gold lead for Unicorns of Love is massive, no doubt there. But C9 yeah. may be able to find an avenue back. And I do think UOL's played really well. Uh, in the other wins they had yesterday, they made a bunch of head-scratching plays in the early game, and then they played the team fights well, yes, but oftentimes it felt like it's because the other team was, you know, doing something silly, and then UOL punished them. But here, they've known they have the scaling advantage the whole time. And I can't think of one instance where they made an over-aggressive play. Yeah. So who is this team that showed up on day three of Rift Rivals? Because it, it's telling us that it's unicorns right now, but based on the early game, it just feels completely different. It's refined. It's a they just refined it in a day. One day. Day it's one. All takes. Lose all the games. Man, all right, changes figured head. it out. Now it's 2-0, and now they're looking to head at least to another win to start oh. Jensen. One more auto, the flash away to stop the expunge. Exile now has to run for his life. He's exhausted. Ultimate not going to connect the yeah, slow gonna, animation. It comes the collapse. Me. Suddenly, Vizichachi on the back line. He's stunned up. They don't have the damage to kill him. And now Exile is leaping forward. But Ray is coming in with that charge. Who's he going to latch onto? It's Vizichachi in the Minionar. Exile goes golden, but Hillisang can't devour him. And he gets stunned up before he can. C9, Silence. this might be the fight that they need. Samix now leaping forward. That's the spray and pay. The double kill for Sneaky. The Ash is looking to turn this back. Zersi on the backside. He's trying to kill Jensen. Can he get the damage down? Yes! Now visit Chachi in Meganar. He is running forward. Ray has remounted. And suddenly Unicorns of Love are starting to lose. Oh, but it's Samix with the turn and the burn and taking down the opposition. Unicorns of Love hunting for a bit more. But at the end of the day, that's a three for two. A bit of a sketchy team fight to start off. But Samix comes in for the cleanup. Ends finishing off with a three for two going in the favor of Unicorns of Love. Unlikely that they'll be able to turn it into any significant objective but still a team fight win for the Unicorn. Yeah, Samix is doing so much damage and it took a while for him to arrive to that fight. That was about the best fight that I think C9 could hope for. Exactly. Where they get a long time before Twitch arrives and they make Exile use all of his Rift Walks in retreat rather than going Ooh. for Sneaky. The Ash Arrow not landing at the start actually misses a lot and then yes. they then missed a bunch of skill shots on top of that. So the, the idea of the fight was good. Missing the skill shots, not the best form of execution. But uh, on top of that, Towards the end of the fight, I think Sneaky actually played this really well, kiting back from a lot of spells. Yeah, I was really impressed with his constant, really good positioning. Like, he's always keeping on the edge. Exile was a little bit aggressive, flashing in to try and get the kill. But then you think, oh, this is going to go really well for, for C9, especially with the fact that Ray going to remount too. They're now in a four versus three. They still have their AD carry alive. But then Samix stealths up. Sneaky doesn't realize that he's come back in. And then with Zerse, the additional CC to set up Samix to the cleanup results in them getting the team fight win. And now they'll be able to get themselves their first straight of the game. Sadly, it gets harder and harder for Cloud9 from here. And we saw in that fight as well, some small miscommunications from UOL leading to some advantages for Cloud9. Exile going golden right as Hillisang flashes in to devour him. Then Hillisang getting stunned as he comes out and unable to complete it. But now, now they just run it down mid. Now they're Chachi. looking to keep the action going. Visit Chachi in trouble, could get picked off. Does go Mega, does try to turn this one back. Uses the Gargoyle Stoneplate. Oh! The oh! 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 Outsmarted Unicorns of Love coming in. Now Exile just cleaning it up. Absolute obliteration once again from Visit Chachi. He destroys C9 and UOL are looking to take down C9. Oh, and Jensen. Another couple deaths added to that list. KDA worsened. Unicorns of Love pushing for the win. And C9 not able to punish the early game. Jensen comes in. He calls it an easy win. And we wanted. To, we thought maybe it's possible. Maybe Xerxes goes down again. Exile goes down again. But it's just so good overall for the Unicorns of Love. Their team fighting down the stretch. Yes, they had the comp for it. But the bait and switch on Nar right there. Stone plate into Nar into absolute demolition. Unicorns of love, they're gonna do it. They're gonna take down Cloud9 for the second time.
time and move up yet another win on the path to the finals of Rift Rivals. Yeah, three wins for Unicorns now. That moves them above all other EU teams. Fnatic can keep pace if they beat TSM in their next game, but this is not what you would have expected after day one. Unicorns looked miserable one, in their two, first three, two three, games, but now they're on a three-game streak. Keeping the superstitions going every time. Bald head, all the hands on it. Shave the chair. Hair. That's what was holding them back. Every time they do win. that after a game, they win the next game. Oh, man. Speaking of trends. It was all about the initial sacrifice for the later success. <laughs> but what this also means is that G2 are now out of contention for the finals. It is a battle between the Unicorns of Love and Fnatic. And given the consistent dominance of G2, so many fans are excited now to see what can be brought to the finals of, of here in Europe because Unicorns, yes, they had a rough day one. They seem like they still have the same issues as before, but when you allow them to play their style, my God, this team is destructive. Yeah, and that's the thing, is they have been improving at a rapid pace if you look at their games across Rift Rivals because even at the start of the day, you're thinking, okay, if Unicorns make it to the final, then it's really not that exciting because they've been losing every early game and it's just kind of random that they're winning the games. But this game, where they stayed even for all of the early game, knowing they had the late game scaling, and played it right. I mean, that's a team you can start kind of getting behind and thinking they have a good shot and if they make it to the finals. It was so clean in the early game. We talked about division, something that we're so critical of for Unicorns of Love, and for good reason. They, they give up so much in the early game, often because of that lack of vision. They saw everything contracts tried to do in the early game. Every gank spotted out before he could make it happen. They played around the throw of the hunt with so much respect. And as you said, yeah, who is this team, this reserved yeah. team willing to play back in the early game? It's, it's a great look for the Unicorns of Love, and they're looking so strong. But I still feel that for C9, they could have been so much more proactive as well. Like, we saw that play in the top lane, which could have actually been a favorable fight for them. They could have been doing that like 10 minutes earlier into the game. They had the Ash Arrow, they had the Rengar Ultimate. There were ways in which I feel they could have tried to been, at least try to make these plays happen, but they never made it work, and UOL eventually found the perfect fight, which enabled them to snowball the game. Well, it definitely did. Well, UOL's jungler was crucial in their victory over Cloud9. Let's find out what he has to say after that game. Thank you very much, Strikos. I'm joined here by Xerxes. First and foremost, congratulations on the win. Thank you. Uh, I am going to quote you on something you said off camera. Finally, an early game where we didn't get shit on. What happened, dude? How did you manage to survive? Okay, so after the first game where we went 0-2, and like you said, we got shit on in the early game, like, like there was no hope for us in the early game where we just died 10 times. We had like a talk and uh, everyone was serious about it. And then the second game, like the second day we go 2-0. And now that makes it 3-0, three wins back to back. You've just eliminated G2 Esports. They are no longer viable contenders for the finals. Only Fnatic left. They're coming up uh, against TSM shortly. But what would it mean to you if you go 4-0 in the last sense and you end up representing Europe in the finals tomorrow? It would have been nice to be 6 0 but uh, I think I'm happy with fourth as well. And I think we can do that. You think you can do it? You've got one more game to play today. Uh, Deficio had some strong words about the UOL style. You know, you have to beat them early. If you go even with UOL until 20 minutes, you're going to lose in team fights to UOL. Is that our, the truth? Our team fights are way too insane. Way too insane. Okay, Xerxes, who is going to win this next matchup, Fnatic or TSM? <laughs> That's a uh, tough one. I would say Fnatic because they are European. You know. Gonna be European, and that means the last games are gonna be more important. Zexy, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you as well. Congrats on the win. We're gonna head to the analyst test to wrap up the game. Thank you very much, Quickshot. Nice to hear from Xerxes there as well. And another win for uh, the Unicorns of Love. And if I look over the trajectory of the last couple of days, first day, they were quite bad, really bad. I mean, we can say that. Then yesterday, they were more controlled, still from behind, but they could win fights and get back into the game. And this game, they just play well all around. Is that a fair assumption to make, Trashy? I do agree with that, yeah. Um, <laughs> They've been getting better. <laughs> it definitely makes the game a lot easier if your solo laners are not dying 1v1 a lot. Uh, so this game, huge improvement on that side. They didn't die. They actually played, played it out properly. And I think a lot of it actually came down to the draft where they secured the, the Gragas for the jungle early, and then they, they banned... C9 didn't pick up the jungle pick in the in the first phase, and then 
they had to pick Rengar, which is more of a scaling pick and can't really punish pre-6, so they couldn't really punish the, the lanes of UOL, and that really helped them. Oh, and C9 first picked LeBlanc, who ended 1-2-2, two, two, by the way. Yeah, uh, and like Trashy was talking about, uh, helping a lot with the solo laners doing well in the early game. Not only did they not lose, but Vizichachi actually smashed Ray mm -hmm. after the one gank uh, that he got from Xerce super yeah. early on. A huge CS lead. Uh, he was a giant force for this team for the entire game. And Exile, as you said, <laughs> uh, in the mid lane, he didn't die in the Cassidy versus LeVanc matchup early on. And he was actually even in CS, and that's what you want. Yeah, he kind of he got to level 11 before he did his first death, so, so that obviously helps. But the way that they execute team fights and actually able to cut back uh, is pretty interesting. Obviously, they lose this team fight, but still, yeah, you kind of see like the, the, the initial strength of the comms. Like, you can see that C9 is still able to keep up, still able to actually hard engage and win team fights and baby CB bait, bait UL into overaggression, but uh, they're already starting to scale. They're already like getting to the point where they can contest team fights. and Unicorns doesn't want anything else besides that. They want to win team fights or at least be, be able to contest them in order to at some point like get adventures out of them. Yeah, and um, it was a lot of Unicorns of Love going mid or pushing the side waves and not really forcing anything. And C9 also, besides this one, wasn't able to force anything any, anywhere else either. So where should they have forced it? They, just, they did get the Dragons, but... I think if they were more cohesive as a unit and actually would have used more TPs maybe, like had LeBlanc a silent earlier because LeBlanc does beat Cassidy until a certain point, like if you utilize that window, you can actually get silent turrets and rotate back into mid lane and get advantage through that, but they didn't utilize that window at all. Yeah, and again, the problem was that they couldn't get any sort of pressure because Ray was so far behind in the 1v1 with his Kled. You would like to think that, oh, Ash Arrow is going to come down the middle with a Kled ultimate and that's like a guaranteed engage, but Cloud9 were never able to get, you know, side waves in position to do that and were never really able to push the tempo. In my opinion, they needed to be more creative with the, with the Rengar pick together with the LeBlanc because to be honest, I don't see them actually winning team fights if they fight at like 5v5 in mid. I think they needed the Rengar to be more f skirmish heavy and like 2v2s, maybe 3v3s on site, where they could maybe just single out one guy and one-shot him. Um, but they didn't really do that. And then when, when they actually hit these three items from URL on the, on the Twitch and Kesselin, there's just no hope. Great point. Let's take a look at a couple of those team fights where Unicorns of Love are so, so good. This one in the jungle getting four kills brought to you by Acer. And this is what you're talking about. The clock is ticking and, well, the alarm bell has rung for C9. <laughs> yeah, this is one where they chase the Tom Kench over the wall and they're, they're using everything to try and get uh, one of the least valuable members of the team. Looks and great. then you end up, oh, they got him, but they're funneled into the small <laughs> corridor. <laughs> the Contracts, them. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the big <laughs> unlucky blast coming right there. <laughs> the big mistake is like they 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 force so hard into the into the Twitch where they actually don't even get on top of the Twitch and they stack up for all the, the AoE damage and then we just saw the damage chart after how much damage the Twitch actually did in the fight and you can't really allow this. Like when you if you do mistakes against the Twitch casting comp, then at some point you will just lose the game. Exactly. Exactly. They were getting, uh, you know, outscaled and they kind of tunnel visioned on that charge. They actually got both summoners out of the Twitch in that fight if they kind of pulled off. I feel like they still had maybe one more attempt left in them, but uh, that was pretty much the game breaker. Yeah, they kind of all chase that one. Like if they, as you said, like just got one more attempt where they actually like, uh, you know, utilize another uh, uh, ultimate of Ray and actually like lock the Twitch down instead of like chasing him down that way, they would have basically been able to get what Unicorns was able to get, which is Nasher. And key point in this is also that you can't make any mistakes in those fights because Unicorns are at scaling and are pretty good at team fights as well. Let's take a look at this one, which looked like it could be turned into C9's favor. And how does it Nar survive? And then he gets <laughs> Mega Nar and he destroys everyone. Home plate, I believe, oh. uh, helped out here. Transforming into Mega as well was just really funny timing. Now, I also think that we talked a lot on the desk here off air about uh, Vizichachi just as a player, and he has those champions like Nar. Well, if he gets a little lead, he will completely take over the game. And we have seen him now play this Nar, where where they counter pick it with the Klet twice. And uh, in my opinion, I don't think it's actually a counter pick. I think the Nar actually has a really good lane into the Klet, um, and we also saw that in this game. So I think we we can question a bit G uh, the the C9. Uh, top lane picks if, if do they have a better pick than Klet or because we've seen a lot of Klet now and uh, and I think Nar looks solid into it and Vizachi has shown that he's super good on Nar so maybe you, you have to take this away from him.
Maybe some cluds have still been successful for NA, but not this one. Vizichachi taking over the game, and after that, UOL win. G2 no longer have a chance to qualify for the final, as they are two wins behind with only one game left to play. But we have more action coming up in just a second as Fnatic takes to the stage to take on TSM. There are standings refresher for you, but stick around, because we'll be back with the next game in just a few.